And now, for the week of April 24th, Adobe Photoshop TV is on the air. Welcome to Adobe Photoshop TV from the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. And here's your host, the Photoshop guy, Scott Kelly, Dave Cross, and Matt Poskowski. All right, welcome to another anabolic episode of Adobe Photoshop TV, brought to you by the National Association of Photoshop Professionals, NAP, the fine people who bring you Photoshop User Magazine. And this week's show is brought to you in part by Logitech, also by Digital Juice and uh, Digital Lifestyle Outfitters, Yellow Machine, and CDW. Yay! Well, welcome, everybody. <laughs> we are back. My name is Scott Kelby, and joining me, representing the great country of Canada, our friends across the border, Mr. Dave Cross, and representing Hillsborough County, Florida, <laughs> Mr. Matt Kloskowski. Fine county He's it is. He's right beside me here to my right. I'm not going to say rock in the house key. I'm not going to do it. They're waiting. All right. I know they're waiting. I'm not going to do okay. it. Okay. I'm, I'm tired of it. Okay. okay. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We have got another salacious show put together for you today. Uh, let's take a look. Of course, we have, we have giveaways, right? Got we giveaways. have giveaways. We've got another. We're giving away another ticket to the Mac Live conference. Excellent. So a uh, couple books, your iPod book. Matt's teaching there. He'll be wearing his rock. Shirt there I will be wearing my rock shirt as well. And uh, we got your iPod book and a couple other prizes that we'll talk about a little bit later. Excellent. And we all brought Photoshop stuff and we have a special guest. We have Ben Wilmore. We'll be giving one of his cool tips a little yes. later. We sequestered Ben. He ripped him off his bus and <laughs> threw him into the offices, made him give us a tip. So he'll be here a little later with that via the magic of videotape. Mr. Cross, what'd you bring us? I have a tutorial that actually comes out of a previous issue of the magazine from the down and dirty column and it's showing you how to create kind of a cutout effect using X-Acto knife. Aha! And Mr. Glaskowski! I have a tutorial on how to take part of a photo and make it look like it's coming out of the borders of the photo. Mm, mm, very, very slick. Coming out. I brought one that's kind of a two-part kind of a um, tutorial. The first part of it is uh, how to put a photo inside another photo. But then we're going to take it one step further and turn it into a studio lighting kind of background thing. So kind of a little two-parter, and I hope we have enough time for that. But I'm going to do it either way, whether we have enough time or not. You're a crazy man. I know. So <laughs> we're going to start off this week with a tip from the kid. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to take a look at how to, how to take one part of a photo and make it look like it's almost popping out of the borders. So if you look at the screen here, I've got an example of it up here. This is just one example, but we're going to do it onto this photo. And this is the effect we end up with. So let's start from scratch here. You will open up a photo that just has a background layer. The next thing you'll do here is create a brand new layer on top of it. And I'm going to use the marquee tool here. And I'm actually going to just draw a rectangular selection around the left side of this photo here. Now, if you draw the selection and you don't like the way you drew it, you can hold down the spacebar key and move it around. Ooh, move ooh. it. So I'm going to draw it over the left part of this photo. And then I'm going to fill it. It's on its own layer, so I'm going to fill it with white. You see white's my background color. I'm going to hold down Control on the PC or Command on the Mac, Scott. And I'm going to hit the backspace key. And then Control or Command D to deselect. So now I've got this white area. Now, part of the problem here is I hid this part of the photo. Now what I want to do is I want to make it look like this surfboard is kind of popping out of this image right here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to select part of this photo over here. So I'm going to do, since I happen to have a very easy photo to select with, I've got the sky. So I'm going to click once with the magic wand on the sky. And I'll click again a couple of times. And you can see I pretty much got all of the surfboard uh, not selected. So then all I do is come up here and go to choose select inverse. And now that selects this part of the photo. Now, if you don't have a photo that's just this easy to select, chances are you're going to need to go to the channels palette and take a look through your channels. And uh, Mr. Kelby, who's next to me, just happens to have written many, many good ways in his channels book on how to select objects using the channels palette. But you could use a lasso tool, though, right? You could use a lasso tool. tool. Or something yeah, there's like a couple, that. but okay. it, most photos aren't going to be this easy. I so. appreciate the plug, now. <laughs> hey, no problem. But most photos aren't going to be this easy. If you do have one, you could always grab that magic wand or uh, the magnetic last or anything like that. All right. So now that I've got this part selected, and don't worry that I have other things selected. All I want to worry about is the surfboard here. And uh, just put this onto its own layer by pressing Control or Command and the letter J. 
and that puts it onto its own layer. So let's hide the background. All I come in here and do is just grab my eraser. I'm just going to erase away everything that I do not want anymore. And now I just see my surfboard. So looks pretty good. Let's put our white layer back on. Obviously, we can't see it, so I'm going to drag the surfboard on top of it. So now it looks like the surfboard is kind of popping out of the photo here. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, what we'll do here is double click this layer here. We're going to add a drop shadow layer style. Click on drop shadow here, and I'm going to change the lighting angle. So kind of looks like it's coming from the right hand side here. Maybe increase the spread and uh, mess with the distance a little bit here. And I'm just going to move the angle so it's coming from up top. And then if you need to, you can drop the opacity down a little bit. And then just click OK. Now, here's the thing. If I show and I hide my drop shadow layer style here, you can kind of see how it starts to encroach over into the original photo. That's with the drop shadow, that's without. Well, a little trick here is you can put this drop shadow onto its own layer. So you can right click. If you're on a PC or if you're on a Mac, you can control click and go down to create layer. And just click OK and look at what happens here. See it put the drop shadow down onto its own layer. So then I can just come in here. I can make a select. The easy way is just make a selection. It selects that side and just choose select inverse and then hit the delete key. Now it gets rid of all that drop shadow that was over here. And now my drop shadow is on its own layer and I could even further drop the opacity increase it, do whatever you need to, and then finish it up. Just uh, mess it up like I did, because I have this nice little layer set up here. And to finish it up, you could add some type up here. And ah, there a nice we go. little poster. Now, let me show you one more thing here. This is another image that I did. And I did the same exact thing, the same exact steps that I did over here. I did on this image over here, but I did one thing different. And I selected with the rectangular marquee, I selected a portion of the photo right in the center here, and I just added a stroke layer style and a drop shadow to it. But that kind of almost gave it a little bit of a photo border, and then it made it look like it was popping out of that border. So you got a couple of different options on which way you want to do it, but either way, you get kind of a cool little 3D effect. Thank you very much, Mr. Kloskowski. Thank you. A wonderful tip, if I might say so myself. You might. All right. <laughs> Speaking of wonderful tips, from the frozen north, <laughs> comes a man with a sh Canada shirt on. That's so unusual for you to wear Canada wear. I know. Wear. I figured I'd just break with tradition today and do something a little, you know, a little different than normal. But, Excellent. You know. Well, he's wearing two shirts. Ironically enough, though, the crazy part is I didn't even buy this shirt when I was in Canada. I bought it from, like, some guy in Milwaukee on eBay. So there you go. <laughs> just when you thought you were doing it because, of, you know, you're in Canada. I have other Canadian shirts, though. You will be seeing. Now, my tip, actually I mentioned, is comes out of a previous issue of uh, the Photoshop User Magazine, where every issue there is a column called Down and Dirty Tricks, which are just interesting ways to do things very, very quickly with some interesting results. So what I'm going to do here, I just have, this works with any photo. That's one of the beauties of this type of technique. And I'm just going to start off by making a new layer. And I'm going to go get my pencil tool, a tool that, honestly, I don't use all that often, but in this case, it does a nice job. I'm going to change my foreground color to white. Now you can do this in a couple of different ways. You can either kind of free form it and just kind of drag to make a cut shape. This is going to be kind of simulating as if someone cut with an old X-Acto knife. Or you can, if you want to be a little more straight, you just click once, hold down the shift key, move over and click a second time. That makes it a little straighter for you. And we're going to make it look like someone who just wasn't very talented with an X-Acto knife apparently because their cuts were not very good and there's a bit of an overlap. And we want to make it, make it do is look like this part here is cut out so we're seeing through to something in behind. Now remember this is on its own layer. We're going to take our magic wand, just click in the middle of it, so it selects all the middle, add a new layer which we're going to fill with white. Now since white is my foreground color, I can press Option Delete on the Mac or Alt Backspace in Windows to fill that and then I can deselect it. Now it looks kind of well, not great at the moment, so I'm just going to switch my layer order so this layer is below. But to give it that really cut out look, there's one simple little effect that we do, and that's just to add an effect called Inner Shadow. And you see when I do that, look at that, now all of a sudden it looks like there's a little cut out hole in our photo. Because it's a layer style, of course, I could always go back and tweak it. But then all that remains to do is add a bit of type in here. So we'll just put something in here. Doesn't really matter what it is. Mexico. Mexico. I'll rotate it and maybe scale it down a little bit, but I deliberately want to make it so that it's initially overlapping because I want to make it look like the type is part of that part that's hidden down below. So with my type layer still active, 
I hold down Command or Control and click on my white box layer, load as selection, and on my type layer, simply click on the Add Layer Mask button. Now it looks like we're seeing through to that page below. All it remains to do is to see here, if I just zoom in, you'll see there's a little link symbol linking the type layer and its layer mask. I want to uncheck that because I want the mask basically to stay put so that I can now click on the type layer, get my move tool, and if necessary, reposition this and move this around. Needless to say, you could create multiple layers in this manner and have a nice little effect that's very easy to add to just about any photo at all. There you have it. Very slick, Mr. Cross. Well, actually, that technique, uh, it came from my Down and Dirty Tricks column, but of course, I co-authored that with Felix Nelson. That was one of Felix's tricks, so kudos to Mr. Nelson. Felix rocks. And Felix does rock. <laughs> Felix, Felix rocks. Felix is, he's the man. we got to get Felix on the show more often. Every yeah. time he, he comes on, yeah. people, people swoon. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. When we come back, we've got a tip from Mr. Ben Wilmore, the, the uber genius guy, and... A rare shot of Ben's bus, so... The magic bus, as we call bus, it. The bus bus, the magic bus. <laughs> Stick around, we'll be right back here on Adobe Photoshop TV. All right, we are back, and uh, we have a special guest who dropped by and did a tip for us, right? That's right, Ben Wilmore. Now, one of the things that we've told you before is often when, when guests show up in our office, then they do a tip for us. But in this we make case, them do a tip for us. <laughs> it's you a must little do different a tip. because yeah. most people just arrive on the scene. Well, he really arrived. Let's go to the video. He docked. Here's, here's <laughs> Ben in his brand new motor coach, and you can see him backing up. Even had, I'm not sure if this guy in the yellow vest was actually came with the bus or not, but this guy actually helped him <laughs> back in. And there you can see Ben. There's Ben in the window, back in his motor coach, into our driveway to get people to move their cars out of the way. And then he came into our office. And let's go ahead and see his tip right now. All right, we're here with Ben Wilmore. Ben dropped in us today right here in our office in Florida, and you have a little tip to share with us today. Yes, I do. I'm going to show you some tips on using smart objects in right. Photoshop CS2. Cool. Let's get right to that. Yeah. Let's explore smart objects. I want to show you a few tips about using them, and to start off, just a few generalities in case you haven't used them before. In this case, I have two images that are identical. I just duplicated one to create the other. I'm going to take the image on the left and go up to the Layer menu and turn it into a smart object by choosing Group in a New Smart Object. And the one on the right, I'm going to leave alone. And now what I'll do is scale this down to any size I'd like, which is image size. And let's bring it down really small. I'm going to make this one 10 pixels. In width, we'll do the same to the image on the right. Image size, bring it down to 10 pixels. The result should look identical when I zoom in. This is all we have to work with now on both files. But what's special is the image on the left has been turned into a smart object. And with a smart object, it will always think back to the original file with all of its original data. So if I take the image on the left and scale it back up to any size, as long as it's not larger than the original, I'll bring mine up to, let's say, 500 pixels in the width. You can see that the quality, I'll have to zoom out to show it all to you, is fine because it could look back to the original information but if I choose the other file and do the same thing to it, it only has the information that you saw on screen a moment ago. So when you zoom out on it, the results look terrible. So anytime I need to scale a file to many different sizes, uh, maybe I'm going to crop it, scale it, and print it many different times, I'll end up turning it into a smart object first. One other special quality about a smart object, I'll close our lousy one on the right, is if I use the crop tool. Let's say I just want to use a portion of this image, like this area. Press Return after using the Crop tool. It's not permanent. It thought about the file size of this when I first turned it into a smart object. Whatever was in that file at the moment I turned it into a smart object is still available here. And if I want to bring all the information back, all I need to do is go up to the Image menu, and there's a choice called Reveal All. 
and that will bring back any areas of your image. So if you're thinking about trying out different croppings on your image, you're not sure what you want to end up with, consider turning your image into a smart object first. But let's get into a little bit more advanced uses of smart objects. I have another file open here, and we're going to talk a little bit about using it with warping. So what I want to do here is go and grab a file that I'm going to warp around this mug to make it look as if it's bent around it. And then we'll do some tricks. So I go up to the File menu, and if I choose Place, I can actually grab a RAW file if I'd like. And since it's a RAW file, when I click on Place, it'll bring up Camera Raw. You can't see all of Camera Raw, but in the lower right, I have a Open button. I'll scale it down and see if you can possibly get to it. Nope. But we'll click on Open. And after doing so, I'm going to scale it down using the normal free transform command. And grab the corner, drag it down just so I can see my mug. Put it over here. Then I'm going to switch over to do some warping. I'll go up to the Edit menu, choose Transform, and we have Warp. I'm going to pull each corner to where I think the corner should appear if they were if this photo was actually bent around this mug. And then I'll adjust the side handles to make it look a little bit more realistic. And I'm not going to go for perfection here because I'm just trying to show you a general concept. Because the fun comes later once uh, we've got the original warping done. And once I'm done with the warping, if I press the Enter key, I can indicate I'm done. We'll get rid of our warping handles. What's nice is because it's a smart object, the warping's not permanent. So if you look at the bottom, I don't quite like the shape of this. All I need to do is go back up here and choose Warp once again. If I wasn't using a smart object, I'd have to start all over because it would give me just a rectangle over my image. But if I do it here with a smart object, it remembers the warping so that when I pull on these edges, I can still modify them. And this is a smart object because I went up to the File menu and chose Place. That's how I inserted the photo. Didn't actually need to go to the Layer menu to uh, turn it into a smart object. Just needed to place the file, press Enter. And once that's done, let's see if we can get a little fancy with it. I'm going to turn this document now that is two layers into another smart object. I'll hold down the Shift key, click on the second layer so they're both highlighted, and I'll go up to the Layer menu, choose Layer, Smart Objects, and put it into a new smart object. All right, we got it there. Now it's going to always refer back to this full-size image with whatever I do with the smart object. And I'm going to go drag it over to our other image, the one we started working with. The color spaces are a little different. That's not going to matter. Just click OK. Probably going to be a little bit uh, large for this, at least a little wide. So I'll scale it down. A little trick when you uh, choose free transform is if the corners are beyond the edge of the photograph you're working on, just type Command Zero, that's Control Zero in Windows, and it'll usually zoom out so you can see all the handles. But in this case, since uh, you can't see my entire screen, you can't quite see the handles. They're just beyond your view, but I can see them. I'm going to scale this down. Press Enter to say I'm done. And now we can zoom up. Now, when you use warping, usually you only can warp a layer once. We already have some warping applied here, where it's applied to the image of the tents with Monument Valley in the background. But since we've encompassed that into a new smart object, we can go back up to the Edit menu and apply additional warping. So you can actually warp a layer as many times as you want, as long as before you warp the layer, you turn it into a new smart object in the layer menu. And I'll bend this all I want. Just get some sort of distortion going. OK, there we go. And now, here's what's special. If you look at my layers palette, we have a smart object up here on top. If you want to edit the contents of the original smart object, what you end up doing is in the Layers palette, double click on the little thumbnail image of this. When you do, it'll open up a separate document that shows you what this was made out of. Take just a moment for it to open. 
And in there, if you look at my layers palette, you'll see I have two layers, and the top one was a smart object. That's the photograph we have here of Monument Valley. And if I'd like to, after I've done all this work, I might decide that that's not the photo I want to use. All I need to do if I want to swap out the photograph is go up here to the Layer menu, go to Smart Objects, and there's a choice called Replace Contents. And it's going to replace the contents of the layer I currently have selected. So let's just choose another one. This is also a RAW file, so when I click on Place, which I move this up, you'll see it, it's going to bring up the Camera Raw dialog box. I'll just use default settings for now. Click Done. It will remember the warping that we've applied to it. And if I save this image by just typing Command S, Control S in Windows, and then close it, it will update the other document it was used within. Here, I'll type Command S. Then let's close this. And you'll see that when this document updates, both warpings that we've applied will still be there, even though we've substituted a different photograph. So if you ever want to warp an image twice, just always group it into a new smart object before you need to do any warping. One final tip is if I go back in here to that layer that contains the uh, smart object that's a raw file, another trick you can do is if you can no longer find the original raw file, you just can't find it anywhere or you just need it quickly, you can also go up here to the layer menu, choose smart objects, and there's a choice called export contents. And that will spit out a new Photoshop file, or in this case, a RAW file. I can name it whatever I'd like. Put it on my desktop here. And now if I actually go and look on my desktop, there should be a file sitting there called New RAW File. So what that means, you can use a RAW file within a layered Photoshop file. And if later on you need to get the original RAW file back, you can make a copy of it. Okay, and as you saw, we can do some interesting things with smart objects, especially when you use nested smart objects in warping. I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll be playing with smart objects a lot more in the future. I'm sure they will. That was a great tip. Now, Ben, Thanks. tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days. You're doing some traveling. You're on doing some yes. tours. Yeah, right now I'm touring the country via motor coach, and you can find out details on my blog at whereisben.com. And that's the main focus right awesome. now. Awesome. And they can on that site they'll find out about any upcoming events you have and all that yes, stuff and I'm, books and yes, I have my Photoshop stuff. for Photographers tour. You'll find dates for that uh, and other information. Also, my corporate website is digitalmastery.com. That's where it's easiest to find out uh, my tour dates of all the seminars I'm going to. Excellent. Well, Ben, thank you once again for joining us, yeah. and we'll look forward to seeing you again next time. That was great. All right, thanks, Ben, for that amazing tip. And by the way, you're, if you're wondering about Ben's bus. What's weird is, you know, Ben just drives that to kind of cruise around town. <laughs> he has a house, he has a car, but when he's going to go someplace, he just goes, makes an I'm going to jump in the bus. bus. No, actually, if you, if, you, if you haven't been watching whereisben.com, Ben's website, Ben sold his house and moved into that bus, and he travels around the country teaching and doing photography and hanging out in the bus, in the, uh, in the tour bus. Yep. So where's Ben? Why? He's on the bus. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, now it's time to go to the Action News Center for Photoshop News. And this week we've added Doppler radar, so we're very excited. Here he is, 8 to 10 inches from me, <laughs> in the Action News Storm Center, Matt Kluskowski. It's Photoshop News from the Action News Storm Team with Matt Kluskowski. He's rocking the house key. This week's news is sponsored by Peach Pit Press. If you go to peachpit.com forward slash Photoshop TV, you'll see that they have a weekly special up there. So you get 35% off of a book and you get free domestic shipping. So go check it out. All right, so first up this week, our friends over at Pixel Genius have updated their plugin. It's called PhotoKit, PhotoKit Color 2. And it's a plugin that applies color correction and balancing to your photos. So you can go check it out over at pixelgenius.com. Now, while we're talking about photos, our uh, very own Photoshop TV co-host Scott Kelby, he's released his very first ebook and it's on Lightroom. So, it's uh, Lightroom is Adobe's new application for digital photographers. Scott released an ebook and the cool thing about this is it's all about how to do everything in Lightroom and as the new Lightroom betas come out, Scott's going to update the ebook each time. So, go to peachpit.com, find out more information about it. 
Finally, Adobe is going to put on a free e-seminar, and it's for the creative suite, but it's for printing professionals. So it's got a whole slew of industry experts on printing with the creative suite. Now, you can find out more about that as well as all the links for the news if you go to photoshoptv.com. Thanks, and back to you guys. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the news, and uh, that was some... Some that news. was some news. That was Absolutely. News now, we're just going to wait for Matt to get back from the storm team. Oh, back. Whoa! <laughs> wow! Sneaks right. up on him. He really does. All right. Uh, Matt is back from the storm team news, and now it's contest time. First, we have to find out who won last week, and then we'll see who's going to win next week. Okay, so uh, the person who won last week's contest through the magic of post-production will again be shown on the screen right now. So gaze at the name. If it's you, you're happy. If it's not, yeah, you're, not well, you're not happy. So you celebrate. Sorry. But what was the question from last week? The, the question from, the question last, from oh. last week. Which oh, that's I, right. You gave the question. I gave the question. So Something I was under, the question and the underwater. Answer. The question was, where in Photoshop do you find an option called underwater? And the little known answer is in the photo filter dialog box. Under the list of filters with all the You're warming right. and cooling yes. right down at the very bottom is underwater. I give anybody credit that knew that yeah. one. I didn't know that, that one. I, found that one. I give anyone credit that knew that one without looking it up in the <laughs> help file or anything. Wow, very, very good. All right, so that was last week's questions. Who's got the question for this week? I also have the question for this week. But let's first tell them of questions. what they're going to win. Let's tell them what they're going to win. We have many, many prizes for you, exciting ones. First, we have... Secrets of the Adobe Bridge, a book by Terry White. My buddy Terry's written an incredible book on the bridge, the Adobe Bridge. Secrets. It's secrets. called Secrets of the Adobe Many Bridge. Secrets. And also the New Look Navigator, which we mentioned before on our show. And then next week, we're going to hopefully have an actual tutorial to show you how to use it. It's a great new device that's been introduced recently. Cool. And, uh, and I have. <laughs> <laughs> I have a book by none other than Mr. Scott Kelby. Now, here's the thing. You go and you do my tutorial that I did earlier, and I'm going to get hate mail because people are going to say, I, my, my background is not a nice blue sky. And I said it in the tutorial, and I really do mean it, though, is if you want to learn how to make selections, this is the book for you. So it's Scott's channel's book. Great books. Here you go, Scott. And he'll even sign it. Thank you, Matt. Okay, and <laughs> what else do we have? We've got a ticket to the Mac Live conference that is coming up here in New York it's just any day now. And uh, it's an incredible conference. We're all going to be teaching there, along with people like Burt Monroy and Deke McClellan and Katrina Eisman and Jack Presnicki and a bunch of our friends. So come and check it out. Uh, it's not just Photoshop, though. It's Photoshop Creative Suite, uh, right. all the nine yards, and some of the cool Mac video products and stuff. Yes. But if you're a Mac person, you can come, of course, because it's called Mac Live. If you are used a Windows platform, absolutely come and check it out because uh, the programs work the same. Right. I think there's also in there a subscription to Layers Magazine. Why, also. thank you, there is. There's also part of the package is a subscription to our sister publication, Layers Magazine. It's the how-to magazine for everything Adobe, and you get a one-year subscription to Layers. If you don't win the subscription, though, you can find these on newsstands nationwide. So we'll have all of those. Gentlemen, show your products. Okay, you'll win those. <laughs> now, <laughs> and after more. all that, maybe I should give them a question. What Please, I beg you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this question they has two too. possible answers. When you have a layer with a layer mask, how can you turn off the effects of the layer mask? Not delete the layer mask, but how can you turn off the effects of layer mask? And there are two possible answers to the this question. Key. Caps it's not lock. the caps lock key. No. Okay. Photo filter. And it's not water, underwater. <laughs> Is it the underwater filter? No. All right. Well, we are going to take a short break. We'll be back with a tip. I get to do my tip finally. Yay! Uh, coming up after the break. Stick around. We'll be right back on Adobe Photoshop TV. Alrighty, we're back. I'm Scott Kelby with Dave Cross and Matt Kloskowski. 
And, and now, I think you have a little something to I share do. with us. We've been waiting all the show for Scott's all tips. All right. Uh, the tip I've got is a two-part tip. The first part is we're going to do both two parts together, though. The first part is how to get a picture inside a picture. The second part is how to turn that picture into a studio shot. So we're going to start with, basically, this image right here. And uh, we've got a, a laptop, and you, I often see like an image inside a laptop or an image inside a window or something like that. And I've got a photo over here to open up here. Let me just open it up there. This photo of these flowers. And uh, by the way, before I do this, I'm going to make both of these downloads available to you. These are from iStockphoto.com, one of our fine, fine sponsors. And we're going to uh, make these available for you courtesy of our friends at iStockphoto. So you'll be able to download these and practice this tutorial right along with it. So go to the Photoshop TV website and download these. Okay. So first we're going to grab the flowers image. We're going to use Select All and just copy it into memory. So Select All and copy it into memory and get rid of that. Now we're going to grab the Tragic Wand tool right over here and we're going to click in the black area of the monitor. Let me just move this out of the way. We'll click in the black area of the monitor and it selects that area. Well, it selected it so easily because it's just one big black area. Now, remember, I've got the, uh, the flowers in memory, right? So if I were to just go hit Paste, of course, it'll just paste it right back on top. Boring. Let's do Undo. What I want to do, because I have a selection in place, is instead of choosing Paste, I want to go one more and choose Paste Into, and it'll paste those flowers into the monitor. <gasps> Okay, wow. that's not the trick. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, but the well, part of the problem is be, besides the fact that they're too large to fit in the monitor, is that they look flat. They're flat facing me. They're not at the angle that the monitor is at. So what we'll do is this: press Command T on a Mac or Control T on a PC to go to Free Transform. Hold the Shift key, and then we're just going to slide in a little bit like this, kind of get the size a little more, more right here. We'll just kind of get to where it more fits inside the monitor. Now, it still looks flat, so what you're going to do is hold the Command key on Mac, the Control key on PC, and you're going to grab each corner and you're just going to line it up with the, with the window like this. There's one. I'm going to grab this one, two. We're going to move the layers palette out of the way. Grab this one, three. Can I guess three? Okay, next one's four. <laughs> you guys. And then, and then this one is five. <laughs> no, there you go. So there's the four corners. So now, as you can see, it's kind of you know lined up in the proper aspect ratio. Now, that's number one. Now we're going to go back over here to the layers palette. Now we're going to turn it into a studio shot because that was just the first part of this. Click on the background layer, and we're going to create a gradient. The gradient that we're going to create is an incredibly useful gradient for product photography. Now I'm just going to slide the layers palette off screen for just a moment, and we're going to click on the gradient tool. And when we do, of course, it brings up the gradient palette. You're going to click right up here, right on the actual gradient itself up in the options bar. And when we double click on that, of course, it brings up the gradient editor. Now, what I need to do is I need to change my colors. Right now, the gradient goes from black and then slowly gradiates over to white. I want to make this color stop a uh, light gray and this color stop a dark gray. To do that, just double click right here on the little color stop. By the way, those are these, these things that look like a little house. They call them color stops. I always wanted to call them color houses. <laughs> All right, double click and we're going to choose a light gray. So just choose a nice light gray color here in the color picker something like that maybe, and click OK. Then go over to this side, double click, and it brings up, and now you're going to choose a darker gray, okay, kind of a middle gray. All right, so now our gradient goes from light gray to dark gray, and click OK. Grab the gradient tool. We are in the background layer. For those of you who don't believe me, there it is, the background layer. And we're just <laughs> going to drag, hold the shift key and drag from the bottom up. So I have the lighter part on the bottom. Now, to make this into a studio shot, we're going to do a couple little more steps. Get the elliptical marquee tool, also known as the round one, and we're going to draw a big circle. The technical term for this is, and I think you know it, a big, <laughs> big circle. <laughs> All right, get a big circle, and we're going to soften the edges of our selection. So we're going to go under the select menu to feather, and we're going to put a big old feather on it. How about, since it's already typed in there, 80 <laughs> pixels? This is a low res image, you can get away with 80. You'd want more like 180 if this was a high res 300 PPI image. Click OK. All right, and now I'm going to go and we're going to bring up levels, image adjustments, levels right there. Bring up the levels command. Now, I'm going to hide the selection. So I just want to make this clear. I'm going to hide the selection from view, but that circular selection will still be in place. The keyboard shortcut to do that is Command H or on PC Control H. So remember, 
selection still there. Now we're going to grab the highlight slider over here and drag to the left. And as we do, you'll see a little spotlight effect kind of show up behind. They're giving it that I've been shot in a studio kind of look. All right, but we're not done. Oh, now we no. click OK. Now don't forget to go Command H or on PC Control H again because your selection's still in place. And now you can deselect by pressing Command D on a Mac or Control D on a PC. Now one last thing to do. Okay, one and a half things. Get the rectangular marquee tool, which I happen to have right here, also known as the rectangular marquee tool. And we're going to drag a rectangle out right over this area right here. So select about the bottom half. Then press Command J or on PC Control J to put just that half up on its own layer. So you can see if I hide the background layer, it's just a half, right? Okay, now here's where it gets fun. We're going to get the move tool. You're going to drag that half straight down. So hold the shift key and drag. And look, it creates a little table for it to sit on, right? Dig? Okay, mm -hmm. something like that, maybe. We'll have it hanging off the edge a little bit. Now, I would also recommend going to Levels. And now you can either lighten that table or darken it. So in this case, we're going to darken it. Get the shadow slider and drag to the right so the table gets a little darker like that, just to create some more contrast between the foreground and background. And if you wanted to add one more step, you probably could, and that would be to add a hue and saturation adjustment layer above these so you can actually tint it. Because we started with gray, we can always change the color later. So let's go here and choose hue and saturation right there from the adjustment layer pop-up menu. Click on the all-important colorize button right there, and then you can see that it became a color. Let's hide the, or let's hide the uh, layers palette. There we go. And now you can just choose whatever color you want for the background to give you that studio look. And there you go. So we've got two tricks in one there. The first part, of course, was putting the, uh, the uh, image inside the monitor. And the second part, of course, is turning the background into the fake studio background. Well, we've come to the part of the show that we like to call the end. However, what we're going to do is, of course, leave you with what we always leave you with is three things to do before next week's show. So, because we want to give you something to do between now and then. So, Mr. Cross, what are you bringing to the table for I have this a, week? a website that I actually discovered through another Photoshop forum called Photoshop Techniques. Someone posted there a, a very interesting website. It's called sciencedaily.com. Now, we'll, again, as we always do, post the link on our website, but sciencedaily.com slash videos. And they have, if you, on the left hand side, you'll see a whole bunch of topics, one of which is photography. And there's about, I don't know, 50, I think, movies. Very short little movies, but on all sorts of photography tips, lighting and shooting and all sorts of very interesting things. Very cool. Uh, what I'm going to give you for this week is something that we, we did probably mention about a month or six weeks ago, but we have, of course, a lot of new viewers and things I want to let you know. Uh, you know, we, of course, we talk a lot about the National Association of Photoshop Professionals and Photoshop User Magazine. If you've never seen Photoshop User Magazine, you can actually go download a PDF of the entire magazine from PhotoshopUser.com. We have a sample issue there for you, and it's the full issue with the ads and the tutorials and the articles. Of course, Matt writes the magazine, Dave writes the magazine as well. Go to PhotoshopUser.com, click on the little picture of the magazine, and you'll see on the right-hand side there's a link to download the whole thing. It's about 24, 25 meg, but I figure if you're downloading Photoshop TV, well, yeah. that's a small <laughs> download you're for you. You're not going to worry. So, all right. So there, that's my project for next week to go check out Photoshop User. Matthew? Cool. I've got a project. Go to Pixel2Life.com. And that's the number two, not the word two. Now, uh, we always mention go to PhotoshopTV.com and you can always get the links that we talk about here on the show. Anyway, go to Pixel2Life.com, our buddy Dan over there. He's not just got tutorials on Photoshop, not just After Effects, not just InDesign. He's got tutorials on every everything program that you can think, ASP coding, PHP coding, you name it, it's on there. It's Pixel2Life.com. Excellent. All right. Oh, and by the way, um, if you can also post your comments on the blog. We have a blog there, and people stop by and post comments. And they post questions, by the way, and uh, we get thousands of questions each week. And as you, as you notice on the show, we don't get to answer thousands of questions. Yeah. We try to answer one or two in our tutorials. But you know, feel free to answer questions. Other people seem to be answering your questions back. <laughs> yeah. But uh, any comments, you can post them there on Photoshop TV. Well, that brings us to a close of another show. Uh, we want to thank, of course, all of our sponsors. Thank you guys for watching. And on behalf of myself and Mr. Cross. See you next time. And Mr. Kloskowski. Take care. He's right here every week <laughs> on Adobe <laughs> Photoshop TV. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for watching.
watching Adobe Photoshop TV. See you next week.